Let us turn now in the New Testament to the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1, reading from the beginning. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. This is thought to be the first letter that Paul wrote to a Christian church. It was forced upon him by circumstances. We read about those in Acts chapter 17. When Paul came to Thessalonica and preach the gospel there, there were a good number of converts, some Jewish people, but many Gentile, non-Jewish people. And those Jews that were not converted grew very angry because Gentiles had uh, come to faith in Christ and were following Paul and the other teachers and they could foresee their synagogue uh, emptying and uh, the Christian church filling up with new Christians and not only were these Jews angry but they became dangerous so much so that Paul had to leave for his own safety and he left Thessalonica came down south uh, and eventually um, came to a place of safety. But he did not want to leave these new converts without further help. True it was that Silas and Timothy were with them, but he so much wanted to help these new converts to be established in the faith, because as we read in verse 6 of this chapter, they became followers, but receiving the word in much affliction, suffering, although the joy and help of the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, isn't it, the way those two things come together. Much affliction, joy of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit's joy uh, was um, something that counteracted the affliction. 
very much. And we read that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we're filled with joy in the Lord, it hardly matters what's happening to us. The Lord is with us and we know him. But they needed teaching and further encouragement. Now, he did try to get back to them for this. Chapter 2, uh, verse 17 and 18. We, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And he sees these hostile Jews as preventing his return as the work of Satan, the devil, using these Jewish enemies and persecutors. And so not being able to get there in person, he does the next best thing, which is to write them a letter. This letter. And the principle always is, if we can't do what we want to do, then we must do what we can. And here, Paul does that with this letter. But of course it becomes part of the New Testament. And it's interesting, isn't it, that far from Satan really hindering and really undermining and destroying this work, He's actually helped to write the New Testament. It was through his opposition that Paul writes this letter. And so again, you see, Satan overreaches himself. He goes too far. And instead of succeeding in destroying the work of God, he is God's instrument and servant in furthering the work of God. Remember that when the devil seems to be having a field day, Everywhere, God is above him. And God even works through the worst that the devil does and persecutors of the church to fulfill God's will. Well, in his opening greeting here, Paul assures these Christians that he is praying for them, making mention of you, all in our prayers, verse 2. And the thing about prayer is, one of the blessings is, that prayer sharpens the memory. Have you ever found that when you're praying, things come to your mind that you've forgotten and you're reminded of things? And here you see, as he was praying for these Thessalonians, there were coming to mind certain things about them that he remembered when he was with them. Verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope. And these three Christian graces, faith, love, hope. You'll always find these three in people who have been truly converted. You've got it in Colossians 1, verses Four and five, again, another place, but it's the same thing. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Always these three. There will be plenty of other graces, but these three are particular, like the three primary colours, red, yellow and blue, which make other colours. So these three graces are the leading uh, characters and qualities of a true Christian. And let us make this point as well that these are distinctly Christian things. It's true that people on a human level have faith, faith in people. Faith in things. People have love. And thankfully, uh, there is true love in this sad, sinful world. And they have hope. They do hope in things. But you see, this is purely on a human level. But these three are uniquely Christian. Work of faith, 
labour of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. So let us look then more closely at these three Christian graces. Would you know what a real Christian is this evening? Would you examine yourself and ask yourself, am I a real Christian? Well, these three will always be there, even a little bit, but they're unmistakable. So let's see, first of all, something active, your work of faith, something zealous and labour of love, and something constant, patience of hope. First of all, something active. And you see that faith comes first, because, of course, this is how we are converted, through faith in Christ to save us and then we continue in the Christian life a life of faith and it comes first because as Thomas Watson puts it faith is the captain grace it's the one that leads all the others but you'll see that here it's spoken of as an active thing your work of faith now, it's not meaning that we work it up as if we've somehow got it and can work it up. No, no. It is called a work of faith for certain reasons. Because it's an activity of the soul. Believing upon Christ so that he becomes our saviour and we're made a real Christian it's never a passive thing. It does, it's never something that just happens. And we wake up one morning and there it is. A work of faith is coming. Coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. Our Lord put it like this in John 6 verse 35. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see, faith is that activity of the soul because faith expresses itself in prayer and asks the Lord and calls upon him for salvation. It's the motion of the soul to the Saviour. Never happened before. Religious people say their prayers, follow prayers maybe. But someone who is being converted really prays for the first time. And it's a spiritual work that is not, I say, something that begins with us, but certainly something that is done by us, coming to Christ. And it's called obedience in the New Testament as well. Romans 16, 26, the obedience of faith. In other words, it does what God tells us to do, which is to come to Christ. You remember the picture in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis where the people of Egypt are suffering a terrible famine. They're very, very hungry. But there is one called Joseph who is in charge of the storehouses that are full of grain. And the hungry people come to Pharaoh and they say, give us bread to eat. And what's his word to them? Go unto Joseph. And you see, we as sinners, convicted of our sin, filled with a sense of terrible need, we come, where do we go? And the word of the gospel is, go to Jesus Christ. And he will open the storehouse, the fullness of his grace and salvation. And give it freely, the bread of life. Coming to him we shall never hunger again, never thirst again. And so the obedience of faith 
But I tell you this, my dear friend, if you're not a Christian tonight, you're in a state of disobedience because while ever you do not hear the gospel as the good news that leads you to Christ and makes you wise to come to Christ, while ever you don't do that, you're disobeying the gospel. And therefore you are re rebelling against God and rejecting his provision for the salvation of your soul. It's the obedience that counts. And that obedience will bring you to Christ. It's therefore a work of obedience whereby we simply come as a sinner to Jesus. Because that's what God tells us to do. It's what God has provided for us and says is freely available to us. Work of faith in complying with that. And one further thing about the work of faith is it's active, it's obedient, but you see, it's got to be a work because it meets with resistance. When once we seek Christ, we find there is a contrary principle working. And unbelief troubles us. We seek to believe, but somehow it is easier to not believe. And we almost don't want to believe, and yet we know we must. And then we almost hear a voice saying, it's all not true, don't bother, don't take it seriously. You'll, you'll be accused of going to extremes and it's all not necessary. And there are, mo most people aren't Christians. You don't need to bother about this. You're with the majority, this little minority of people. They don't count. They can't be right. The rest of the world must be right. The work of faith. Oh, there's so much contrary work from the devil. Satan hindered us and he does have that hindering effect upon us. Maybe other people say, oh, you don't want to take this seriously. You don't want to believe this kind of thing. Science has now disproved the Bible, the miracles and creation and all that the Lord Jesus is supposed to have done. You don't need to hear that kind of thing. I've never believed that in my life and I'm perfectly happy. Why should you take this so seriously? And there will be every discouragement, every hindrance children at home in a non-christian home will hear father and mother putting a dampener upon serious interest in the bible and in salvation and it will be hard for them perhaps john trapp put it like this we believe not without much conflict when faith goes about to lay hold on Christ, the devil wraps her on the fingers and would beat her off. Hence the believer hath much ado to believe. So many difficulties to surmount. Work of faith. But you see, where faith is genuine and real and is coming into exercise, then nothing, nothing will stop it, although it tries its hardest. Because you see, the great thing is that saving faith is the Lord's work in us. It's called in Colossians 2 verse 12, the operation of God. It's a supernatural thing that is happening to us. We're born again and the fruit of the new birth is faith. And the ability now and the concern and the longing to come to Jesus and trust in him and receive him as Savior and Lord. And that Lord's work in us enables us to have a work of faith to come to him. And he stirs us up. He draws us out. And he enables us to exercise faith and to lay hold upon Christ and the eternal life that is set before us. The faith of God's elect is, a, is an invincible thing, although it has a struggle and will always have a struggle. 
But you see, the Lord will bring us finally to rest in Christ. There's that beautiful picture in Genesis chapter 8 of Noah's dove. Genesis 8 and uh, at verse 9, where the flood is on the earth and the ark is on the waters. And Noah knows that the time is near when the, uh, the flood will recede and the earth will dry and they can come out of the ark. He sends a raven to test the uh, earth around. The thing about the raven is, being an unclean bird, it flies around and it's alighted on dead carcasses, feeding on it, doesn't come back to the ark. It's at home in a world that's under judgment and death. And that's the picture of the unbeliever. But this dove, he sends out this clean bird, this pure, clean bird. And it flies back and forth and it says, it finds no rest for the soles of its feet. It doesn't want to alight upon dead bodies of people and animals. It doesn't want to stay where there's judgment and death. And it comes back to the ark. And then you've got this beautiful thing in chapter 8 and verse 9. Then Noah put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And both the ark and Noah are a type of Christ. Noah means rest. And the ark was a refuge from the judgment of the flood. And if you have a margin Bible where it says, Noah pulled her in unto him, it's caused her to come. And that, uh, and that dove had rest. And you see, that's faith. Struggling to come, but sweetly drawn and caused to come. And that's what saving faith is. We're, we're drawn to the Saviour. We need the refuge from judgment. We need that place of rest for the soul. The place of salvation. And our Lord draws us. Brings us. And we say return unto thy rest. O my soul. The Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee and that's the work of faith coming to rest upon the object of saving faith which is the Lord Jesus Christ have you come there he says come unto me and I will give you rest it means peace your sins are forgiven rest in your mind and soul you're, you've got peace with God now. He's reconciled to you. No longer offended with you. But now he shows you favour. He's your God and your Father. You're right with him. Your sins are all taken away through the blood of Christ. And God doesn't impute them to you because he's imputed them to his Son who suffered in your place. And you're forgiven. And all your sin is blotted out. Your guilty past is no more in the sight of God. You've got a new beginning. You belong to him now. And oh rest. Rest in Christ. And so something active. And we never rest. Not in conversion. Until we're at home. In the saviour. And then we know. He's my saviour. He saved my soul. And I belong to Jesus, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. May you be drawn and may you come to that place, resting in Christ. 
bringing nothing with you to recommend yourself. <coughs> no requirement, no contribution, no preparation. Come as you are to a willing saviour, more willing to save you than you are to be saved. Your work of faith and you will find rest unto your soul in him. And that's how we continue your work of faith right to the end of the Christian life. We walk by faith and not by sight, believing, trusting, following. And that faith which is real, Jesus is real, God is real, heaven is real. Faith is the great faculty that enables us to relate to things unseen but not unknown. We walk by faith. And you know, it's no easier at the end of life to believe than it is at the beginning. And John Flavel has this pertinent, penetrating quote. He wrote, There be two signal and remarkable acts of faith, both exceedingly difficult, namely, its first act and its last. The first is a great venture that it makes of itself upon Christ, and the last is a great venture too, to cast itself upon the ocean of eternity, upon the credit of a promise. And we shall need faith, you see, at the very end. And it's saying really that to die in faith as a Christian is rather like being saved by faith when we became a Christian. It's similar. Have you ever thought about it like that? When you come to the end of life, it's like when you were converted. It's a new thing. You'd never been there before, but you venture you don't know what's ahead of you. You don't really know what, what's going to happen. All you know is you must trust in the Saviour. Well, at the end of life, you've never been this way before. And you don't know exactly what's going to happen. When you close your eyes in death, you open them in eternity, a new, untried, unfamiliar thing. It's a venture. But just as at the beginning when you became a Christian and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved and you found him to be such a wonderful saviour and far beyond what you ever imagined it could be like to know him and be blessed in following him, the half was not told you. It was all true. It was all real. It was all wonderful. And so it is in death. You venture by faith. You put yourself wholly into the hands of Christ who abolished death for the believer, brought life and immortality to light, and you'll find, you'll wake up in heaven, and you'll see the Saviour, and you know that whatever heaven is, it's Christ. You see him, you delight in him, you fall down at his feet adoringly, and oh, you're blessed to be at home forever. And all, all eternity to discover the wonders and the glories of that world. It's not entered into us here. Just what God has prepared for them that uh, love him. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But oh, we shall know then. And just as surely as we've entered the Christian life for nothing but good and blessing. So we shall enter eternal life for the same. But faith at the first, faith at the last, and all the way through, something active. And some believers are wonderfully strengthened, aren't they, in the last hours, to give a wonderful testimony to uh, the reality of these things. I heard of one man who, when he was dying, he said, it's not that hard. And he, he, he saw light coming towards him. And it was the Saviour coming to take him home. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's not so 
full of assurance. Sometimes it's overclouded, I know. But sometimes we can be strengthened in faith to say that all I have believed all my life long and what I've tasted of the Lord Jesus, that he's gracious, I now know is all real and all true. And when I need him most, he's here for me. It's all real. And it even is possible to speak to others and say, make sure that you join me and meet me in heaven. Trust in my Savior for yourself and you'll join me in the glory. As a powerful testimony, that is, your work of faith. Some believers make their best witness at the very end. Even in great weakness, they can say something And what they say is remembered, registers. It speaks of Christ. They'll only speak of Christ. They won't speak about their good works. They won't speak about what they've achieved. And they won't say, I've been a good person and I hope that God will receive me at the end. They'll only speak of Christ, the Saviour, his precious blood, his righteousness that's justified them. They'll speak of grace the undeserved love of God, and they'll give all glory to God and all glory to their Saviour. That'll be their work of faith, to bear testimony like that. Well, something active. And then secondly, something zealous and labour of love. What does that mean? It's not labouring for our salvation, of course. Our blessed Lord has done all that and finished the work and it comes to us as a free gift. But it means that when someone is converted they want to do something for the Saviour whom they love. They love him because he first loved them. And there are opportunities aren't there to serve the Lord Galatians 6 and verse 10, as ye have therefore opportunity, do good unto all men, especially unto them which are of the household of faith. And our Lord gives the pattern, the picture in John 13. He washes his disciples' feet, which is an act of great condescension. The Son of God clothed with a towel and a bowl of water Washing the disciples' feet, dusty from that walk to where they now are. Taking the place of a household servant. So much so that poor Peter balked at it at first, until our Lord made him realise that he must submit to this. And when he'd washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Not literally foot washing, as I have done unto you. What is illustrated by the foot washing, feet washing, which is a deed of humble service to fellow Christians over and over again. And that's a mighty and a precious thing. It can be a labour of Love, And our Lord says in John 13, verse 34, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Loving deeds of kindness and service. What can I do for my dear master who has done all for me? And if I do things for him, what's the mainspring? What's the motive? Labour of love. Love is the highest and most powerful motive of all, isn't it? Even, in, even on a human level, what's more powerful than the motive of love? When a little child is very ill, the parent will be up day and night Missing sleep, 
going out of their way to look after that little child. Why? Not because it's their child. Well, of course, that's the reason. But what's the motive behind it? Love, protectiveness, caring for that little one. When a wife is unwell and a husband worthy of his name will go out of his way and not count anything too much to look after her and minister to her needs, deny himself whatever is needed. Why does he do it? Because he said, in sickness and in health, on the wedding day, because he said, oh, I must keep my vows, I must keep my prom... Well, it's more than that, isn't it? It's a labour of love to the one whom he loves and from whom he's had so much love. And he's devoted and he'll do it no matter what. Labour of love. In Genesis 29 and verse 20, you've got that beautiful case of Jacob who had to work seven more years for that grasping man, Jacob uh, uh, Laban, in order to win the hand of his daughter, Rachel. And he was willing to work hard as a shepherd, day and night, but they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. What did it matter sitting up at night, awake, getting frostbitten, looking after those sheep? What did it matter defending them from beasts? What did it matter guarding them from robbers? The frostbite in the night, the heat of the day. If he could see her dear face, he would say, it's worth it. And you see the labour of love for Christ's sake. To see him by faith. To know that he's pleased. The labour of love. He says to Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. And according to the love will be the glad labour. And if in serving the Lord, that is serving others in his name, or serving the Lord in the spread of the gospel, service in the church, if it is getting wearisome, if you feel a bit jaded in it, you know what the cure is? It's a fresh sight of Christ. And it's the soul-refreshing view of Jesus in his word. Renewed fellowship with him. That you are again in close communion with him, the beloved of your soul. And you can say, nothing is too much trouble for his dear sake. He is worthy. He who has done so much for me, oh, that I could do more for him, for his people, for his church, for his cause and truth. It's a labour of love. Sometimes is hard work, sometimes is hardship. But we don't think about that. We think about him. And you see, when we lose sight of him, then it is that it becomes wearisome and tedious and jaded. But ah, he knocks on the door. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Renewed fellowship. That church at Ephesus, although they were very busy and very efficient and very zealous and faithful in dealing with heretics, the Lord was outside and they didn't know it. They'd left their first love of him and he wants to come back in and he wants to be again the one who dwells in our hearts by faith so that we know him again. And love him. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Something zealous. And that zeal born of love. 
And one further thing before we conclude. Something constant and patience of hope. Patience meaning not resigned, waiting for something without complaint. But it means rather enduring optimism. Patience of hope. The Christian life is the perseverance of the saints, which the Lord works in his people so that they do carry on, even in the face of opposition and persecution and suffering and all the rest of it, they keep going. Job 17 verse 9, The righteous shall hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger, because the Lord gives grace to do that. They haven't any strength of their own, but it's that derived grace that the Lord works in them so that even though it's so hard, they cannot give up. They must persevere. The Lord has put that principle in them of life, union with Christ, communion with him. They follow him all the way to heaven. And of course, there's the ultimate future. We hope for that we see not, but we with patience wait for it. Romans 8.25, there's a heaven after this life and there is also the blessed hope of our Lord's return. And the thing is, you see, believers will go to heaven one way or the other. We'll either be taken to heaven in our souls and depart and be with Christ and our bodies buried and at rest in the grave awaiting the resurrection. If we're alive when our Lord actually returns, then we'll not even die, but we'll be caught up with the Lord together with those who have died in Christ with their resurrection bodies. And we'll be changed and we'll all be one with Christ forever with the Lord. One way or the other, heaven is sure. First in our souls, afterwards in our bodies perhaps, or soul and body, all together when the Lord returns. Like Enoch and like Elijah, types of this very thing. But isn't it exciting, the fact that at the appointed day, our Lord shall come. And we're not amongst those who fear for the future of the planet and think that we're going to destroy the planet by our uh, fossil fuel usage and carbon and overheating the planet and that kind of thing, as if it's all subject to us. That's forgetting God. It's atheism. God is in charge of the universe. And at the appointed hour, history will end when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again for his people and to deal with his enemies. What a wonderful thing to be on the Lord's side, to have a work of faith which has brought us to a saving uh, place in Christ and a labour of love which has done that labour and that loving, devoted work which is more important than any other work in the world and animated by hope that one day He'll either call or he'll come. But either way, glorious future. And this very world, 2, to, 2 Peter chapter 3, the earth and all its works shall be burned up, all these things shall be dissolved, and new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Heaven and earth one together, the material creation renewed and heaven and earth, paradise restored. Resurrection bodies in the glory of a garden of Eden. Infinitely more glorious than that which was lost. How wonderful, dear friends. We're all heading that way. One Sabbath more. One Sabbath less. Every Sabbath they're like stepping stones toward heaven or like climbing the ladder upwards nearer now than when we believed. What a wonderful thing. Unbelievers, it's all decline, isn't it? It's all 
weakening, departing, ultimate loss. The believer is getting better and better, nearer and nearer to the time when heaven and glory will be ours. Patience of hope. We continue with fortitude and steadfastness, perseverance. Well, these three graces. So this is how you tell if you are converted. Faith, are you trusting in Christ with all your heart because you know that only he can save you? Love, do you love him and his service? Even though you say your love is weak and faint, but oh, you do love him. And you can say like Peter, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Hope, heaven, means more than this present life. His appearing one day. Well, these three wondrous graces, they can be present even in a glimmer, even a little. It's not so much the degree is if they're there at all. And if, if you can honestly say, I believe in Christ to be my saviour. I love him. I love his people. I love doing anything for him. I hope in heaven. A better world set before me. Well, may the Lord make these things sure for us all. For the glory of his name. Amen.